all of the people in all the coastal communities in New England live by the grace of the moon. The moon's given us the gift of the tides, and the tides flush water in and out of our estuaries, our marshes, and that has an exchange of nutrients that's critical to our whole coastal ecosystem. We have to have healthy ocean and coastal environments in order for us to have a healthy economy, which is the basis for healthy communities. Salt marshes are some of the most productive habitat in the world. They rival tropical rainforests for productivity. They provide a back and forth for wildlife, for fish, as a nursery grounds. A natural, healthy salt marsh will rise with sea level so that we maintain elevation over time, maintain that protective buffer between our houses and the rising sea. Estuaries are producing grasses that absorb carbon dioxide and sequester it in the roots and into the mud. Other countries around the world are talking about blue carbon as a concept. One way to mitigate the excessive amount of CO2 in the air is to protect our coastal wetlands. It's like a factory that takes carbon out of the air and transforms it into a farm that can be used by animals. It's the energy that the plants derive from the sun to fix that carbon and that energy is transmitted through the food web to power all these other organisms, including we who eat the shellfish and finfish. The estuary added up to about 1,100 acres of marsh prior to the construction of the dike. That salt marsh has now shrunk down to about 35 acres. And there's been a really dramatic change from this open, expansive, grassy marsh to a shrub and tree thicket. The whole purpose of building the dike was to try to dewater the wetland. The problem with that is that when you drain salt marsh peat, it's loaded with sulfur. That sulfur is innocuously stored in waterlogged salt marsh peat. But if you drain a salt marsh, that sulfur is oxidized to sulfuric acid. On top of all of that, the water has been freshened by the exclusion of seawater, so the pH goes really low, or acidity goes really high. The aquatic habitat becomes untenable for aquatic animals. Oxygen has been depleted seriously because salt water brings in oxygen and the absence of that, if there have been fish kills. It seems like uh, you, you've, you've choked off some, some vital component to the natural exchange of the things necessary for health of shellfish and the microorganisms that get produced as a result of freshwater intrusion. It's really pretty dramatic how fast it can happen uh, when you remove these structures. Fish in the shellfish larvae will flow right in with the tide. If you uh, give nature half a chance, it'll just fix itself. The immediate impact is on the 990 or 1,000 acres roughly on the land that will become healthier and much more productive. But the fish that will be in this area as a nursery will then swim back out and provide some of the base of the food chain for our offshore fisheries all, all the way out to George's Bank. The improvement of water quality is, can't be underemphasized. It's the lifeblood of our shellfish industry, it's the lifeblood of our the healthy environment itself. One of the other benefits that the Herring River will play when it's restored is that with sea level rising and more intense coastal storms coming our way, that habitat will be able to buffer some of the flooding potential that will come with these storms. The restoration of the river is for those, who, mostly for those who come after us. The marsh will recover slowly and get better and better, and you know people will benefit everybody from the wild, wild pickers of shellfish out here in Wellfleet Harbor to bird watchers and fishermen. The fish in the Gulf of Maine feed on something. What they feed on feeds on something else, and it's all based on nutrients. And a river marsh ecosystem provides those nutrients. This one's been breathing through a straw for a hundred years. We just want to give this river back its voice.